Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to the Friday edition of The Realignment. I've got a great book to discuss today with the author Siddharth Kara. I'm speaking about Cobalt Red, How the Blood of the Congo Powers Our Lives. Siddharth was recently on the Joe Rogan Experience, so if you haven't got to check that out, definitely hit up that interview after our conversation. We're focused on all things Cobalt. It powers everything from laptops and smartphones to electric vehicles. The key thing in this conversation though is there's a heavy, heavy, heavy cost, especially in the Congo, to cobalt. So if you'd like to learn about this issue and why there's a moral cost to progress, this is a great and really informative conversation. Hope you guys enjoy it. Have a great weekend. Siddharth Kara, welcome to The Realignment. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you. Let me ask you a naive sounding question. Why does slavery still exist? Yeah, it's not naive at all. Uh, in fact, it's a it's a, one of the most pertinent questions we should be asking because, uh, you know, we study in history books that uh, slavery was abolished in the 1800s, um, starting in England and eventually in the United States. Um, so this is all done, right? There's no more slavery. Um, but in fact, what happened is slavery was abolished on paper, um, uh, but it persists and it persists and continues to evolve uh, across the global economy uh, for the same reason slavery has always existed. There's a certain class of people uh, who are deemed to be worth less and can be exploited uh, for their labor in servile, offensive, um, brutal conditions to generate profit uh, up the chain. And that's why slavery continues to exist. And there's a kind of modification I want to add to the question because I'm not just asking that in the sense of History was supposed to be over. There's, you know, Hegelian progress. And we've not, you know, we've moved on from the 19th century, more in the sense of slavery is economically inefficient. Uh, a country that depends on slave labor isn't going to be as economically productive as a country that, let's say, is still impoverished, but is still paying people decent wages. Like, why would a country especially once you kind of take the racial and more sort of like political idea side things out of it, why would a country allow that to continue? Well, so slavery is inefficient for everyone except for the slave exploiter. Um, and, and it's very efficient for them uh, and their stakeholders up the chain. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, if you run a business, any business throughout history, uh, labor has always been one of the highest, if not the highest expenses. And so slavery, of course, it's cruelty, it's uh, violence uh, and, and all of that, but fundamentally it was an economic crime driven by uh, the desire to minimize or eliminate labor costs. Um, and then for the exploiter who does that, for the slaver and producer who does that, they can generate more profit um, by stripping out labor costs. So that, that economic rationale um, continues to exist, and it exists and is still beneficial for those who exploit people in servile labor conditions uh, across the underbelly of the global economy. Uh, there is a subclass of humanity because they are grindingly poor, disproportionately people of color, disproportionately in some sectors, female gender, um, who are either out of sight, uh, do not count as much. And so one layer up from them there's a class of reprobates who uh, are willing to exploit individuals in slave-like conditions and then pass the profit benefit up the chain. And once you get to the top of the chain, you're talking about multinational corporations that sell us our clothes and our food and our chocolates and our jewelry and our shampoo and our pizza dough and our gadgets and our cars. You think, well, shouldn't they be pay paying attention to what's happening uh, all the way down their chain to make sure that there's nothing like child labor or child slavery or even just uh, uh, extreme labor exploitation taking place. And that's the pertinent question that we need to ask across the global economy. Why isn't there more attention paid by the stakeholders at the top of the chain who are ultimately also um, profiting from labor exploitation? Why aren't they taking more uh, accountability and paying more attention to conditions at the bottom of their supply chains. Yeah, this is a 
good time to get into definitions then. We were just chatting before the recording started. Your first ever podcast appearance was the episode you did on Cobalt Red with Joe Rogan. I was saying that that's the definition of jumping into the furthest um, end of the pool to have that be your first episode. But during the conversation, you were kind of interchangeably referring to people in the Congo as slaves, but then other times you'd refer to people who are being paid less than a dollar a day. So like, what actually is the definition of slavery? Um, Because like, isn't as simple I'm taking as um, you're not literally paid anything at all. What's the actual definition now then? No, terrific question. Because, you know, throughout most of history, um, slavery meant owning someone like property, literally having title over them and owning them like property, like you would a horse or a chair or a house or a car or whatever. Uh, And so like any other piece of property, you can do whatever you want to to it. Uh, And so that's what uh, people did throughout history to slaves Uh, in in the case of a human being, exploiting them and abusing them and and profiting from their labor. Now, in the modern sense, today you can't own a person anywhere on the planet legally, Um, but that doesn't mean it's impossible to treat them as if you own them like property. Um, And that's what people mean by modern day slavery or modern slave, that you can't actually legally own someone, but you can essentially treat them in that same way and exploit them for their labor in horrid conditions. Now, um, whether they're paid 50 cents or a dollar or a dollar and a half or given food or given shelter or $2 and 22 cents, that's ultimately irrelevant. What's relevant is if you're exploiting someone and treating them like property against their will, coercing their labor, um, that constitutes modern day slavery in how we think about it. So what does coercing labor mean then? So I, coercing labor, you think of um, the type of populations that be vulnerable to that, like let's say like migrants, um, that seems to be like a very obvious opportunity for, for coerced labor. But in the case of once again, the Congo, we're talking about people who live in the country. So it's not maybe as much of a case of migrants, I would guess. What what actually forces the coercion part to happen in a situation like that? So there's a range of uh, scenarios and, um, you know, international law tends to recognize that coercion can take many forms. So there's the obvious forms of coercion, which is the threat of violence. Um, I mean, that's the easy one, that if you don't do this work, there will be violence inflicted upon you to make you do it. Um, and so that's that's easy, easy enough, coercion. Um, but coercion can take other forms. There can be um, uh, psychological forms of coercion. There can also be coercion by circumstance. So let's say you have a population of people who are displaced or grindingly poor, and there is no other way to survive but doing a certain kind of work. And you know that basically they'll accept any condition uh, of labor uh, uh, as long as it means that they get something that will help them survive for that day. Uh, and so there's coercion and duress um, uh, forces of extreme poverty, of displacement, of lack of alternative. Um, and it gets a little bit uh, fuzzier there, but international law is very clear on recognizing that these constitute forms of coercion as well. It doesn't have to be the overt, I will beat you or stab you or shoot you if you don't do this. It could be you don't have another option to survive and this is the only option you have and i'll give you my 50 cents or a dollar so you have enough food to eat for today if you do this work which is dangerous you will probably get injured you may very well die uh but you think what's my alternative you know i have this devil's choice um i do this work that may invariably that may kill me on any given day or i may suffer a grievous injury on any given day but i'll eat or I don't do it and I don't eat. And when you have that kind of scenario, those are coercive forces of lack of alternative, of duress, of poverty. Um, uh, And when someone up the chain is relying on that reality um, to avail of the products of that labor, in the case of the Congo, cobalt, um, that's slavery, that's slavery. I'm not saying every person digging for cobalt in the Congo is a slave, but many of them are. Yeah, that's the perfect pivot to the actual book topic. So a couple of questions here. So A, just what is cobalt at a literal like natural resources level? And then two, like what's the significance 
to the broader electronics conversation that comes in there? Yeah, so right now, everyone who's listening to our conversation is listening to it, I'm confident, on a device that has cobalt in it. 99.99999%, if not 100%. Um, cobalt Quick question, is, what would be that? What would be that 0.001? The 0.01% is just me accounting for the possibility that there's something out there I don't know about yet that allows people to uh, listen to this podcast. I don't know. So the real uh, answer is you you don't know of anything I, else, I, I that isn't it? Yeah. 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 Like that 0.001% is just, I toss that out for God because he's probably got knowledge I don't have. But everybody is listening on what? A smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, some other rechargeable device. Um, cobalt is in the battery. So what is cobalt? Cobalt is a metal. Um, and it is found in the um, cathode part of just about every single lithium ion rechargeable battery made in the world today. That's all the gadgets that we use uh, to conduct our daily lives, uh, as well as uh, increasingly electric vehicles. Uh, they have ca uh, cobalt in their batteries as well. So cobalt is ubiquitous. Um, we can't function, you and I, people like us, we cannot function, we cannot get through a day without cobalt. Uh, now, roughly three-fourths of the world's supply of cobalt is mined in a small patch of the Congo. So, in a way, people like us, many people in the world, billions of people in the world, cannot function on a day-to-day -day basis without cobalt coming out of the Congo. And it is mined in uh, appalling, subhuman, violent, uh, dangerous conditions, unsustainable conditions involving massive pollution, contamination, clear cutting of trees, just utter destruction of people and earth in the Congo, uh, feeding cobalt up the chain to companies that are worth trillions of dollars and sell us the devices that we use every day. And as I said, increasingly also the electric vehicles uh, that we are uh, adopting to transition out of fossil fuels and attain climate sustainability goals. Man, what's interesting in what you just articulated there is, obviously we're gonna do a section of this podcast where we're comparing the movement you're describing to the 1990s debates over sweatshop labor, sweatshop labor. but it seems like a key obvious difference then though, is that 70% of the cobalt is there. So this isn't like with Bangladesh where there's a debate about, okay, maybe this could be in Mexico. Maybe this could be in Vietnam. There was a, this is the whole point of 1990s globalization. It was a race to the bottom, which ultimately featured debates and choices there. But if we do have our goals with electric vehicles, but just basic cell phones, laptops, et cetera, someone is going to have to get something from the Congo, no matter what happens. So can you just talk about this dynamic I'm describing? Yeah, that's right. No, that's, you're, you're right on point. That's exactly right. I mean, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, capitalism won the day uh, and the capitalist model spread across the world. And as you said, race to the bottom, where can I find the cheapest labor to make my stuff? Uh, and so then you've got uh, garments made in Bangladesh, widgets manufactured in China, um, uh, uh, and so on, right? You can go across the global economy. Um, uh, where is there cheaper, under-regulated, shadowy labor markets where I can get things made on the cheap uh, because now the world is open uh, and I can ship it from anywhere for a pretty you know, marginal cost and then sell it uh, at retail and generate more profit. And so uh, you're right. If um, attention suddenly shined on child labor in garment factories in a certain country, okay, we can just shift a little bit over here or shift a little bit over there. Um, but with resources, similarly, uh, you can get a lot of things from a lot of places, oil, gold, you know, on down the list. Uh, the world is full of these things. The Congo, and when I say the Congo, I mean a small patch of the Congo in the southeastern corner, holds more cobalt than the rest of the planet combined. Uh, so you cannot avoid Congolese cobalt. There's not enough other cobalt out there remotely to meet demand. Um, and it's not just that more than half of the world's cobalt is there, but roughly three fourths of production is there uh, of, of cobalt supply. And, and uh, forecasts are only that it will increase in terms of share. Um, so yeah, 
you can't just say, well, let's shift our garment factory from this place to that place. No, we have to fix the problem on the ground in the Congo. And it's a problem stakeholders at the top of the chain are all aware of. Uh, but they turn the other way, look the other way, continue minting profits, continue selling us the gadgets we need to serve function each day. Um, and the question is, well, why is it okay to treat the people and, and the environment in the Congo in this manner? in Africa, right, in this manner. And it's okay because that's how the global north has been treating the people and resources of Africa for generations and centuries. So it's just the latest chapter in a long story of foreign pillage and plunder of the people, resources uh, of Africa. So here's the question, though. I'm always interested in the kind of counterfactual of like, why in the case of this specific resource, is it leading to this terrible context. So insert statement about the global north, oil is exploited. There are all sorts of resources that are exploited, but they don't always result in a situation as bad uh, as we would describe in the Congo here. So is the reality just that because there's an essential monopoly operationally on this resource to like the Congolese state is like near zero when it comes to state capacity? I guess what I'm kind of trying to ask you is, if we're talking about profit incentives and like massive corporations who have stockholders and everything like that, it seems like your incentive would always be to r- race to the race to the bottom. So why is cobalt unique in comparison to all sorts of other resources, which obviously there's history, there's bad dynamics, but wouldn't, I think, extend to this level of depravity almost? Yeah, this is look, this is extreme. There's no... There are um, severely harmful, violent, exploitative conditions at the bottom of many, many global supply chains, okay? Uh, But what's happening in the Congo is extreme. It's extreme, of course, because of the amount of money that's generated at the top of the chain. Uh, It's extreme because of how many people's lives this chain touches, everyone. Um, But it's also extreme because of what's happening on the ground in the Congo. And that's a mix of you know, uniquely tormenting circumstances. Um, uh, you know, the, the Congo, the Congo was starting off at the bottom already. I mean, it is. I'm quite confident in saying the most heavily exploited place on earth. And I, I don't mean just now. I mean going back generations. Um, One fourth of all the slaves carted across the Atlantic throughout the duration of the entire Atlantic slave trade, departed from Luongo Bay, which is the mouth of the Congo River, okay? Across three and a half centuries. So already you've got a massive um, uh, destruction of people, culture, family, uh, economy, caused by three and a half centuries of the slave trade. Then you get to the colonial period, and this is the Belgians, um, and the uh, malignant Um, consequences and legacy of King Leopold. Um, And history is, you know, with very, not without its own um, tragic sense of of irony. Uh, And you can't make these things up. But, you know, Leopold got his hands on the entire Congo, the entire interior of Africa in 1885 as personal property. He owned it personally. And that was the same year that a fellow named Benz invented an internal combustion engine uh, and put together a car that had steel clad wooden wheels that could go up to a certain speed before the wheels fell apart. Three years later, uh, another fellow named Dunlop invented a rubber tire and that allowed the car to go much faster. And lo and behold, the Congo rainforest was one of the largest known sources of rubber trees on the planet. And Leopold deployed this mercenary army that terrorized, uh, killed and slaughtered the Congolese population to extract rubber sap. He walked away with billions of dollars. The Congo was devastated, suffering probably a 50% destruction in its population. In addition to the harm, terror, and consequence of that uh, brief 23 period uh, of colonial destruction. Then the country gets independence and it has a chance It has a chance at freedom. It has a chance to use its resources for its own benefit. And its first leader, Patrice Lumumba, that was his great promise that won him 
the election at independence. Uh, uh, and at that time, the minerals in the part of Congo that are relevant to cobalt called Katanga had just been prospected in the early 1900s. Um, and they were starting with copper mining and by independence mining in that part of the country, the or 80% of the country's entire economy. 11 days after the country was free, Belgium annexed the mining provinces. They didn't want to get, they wanted to keep the money. And then there's a whole side I won't uh, get into of how um, the, the neo-colonial powers of Western Europe, the United Nations and the United States conspired um, to rip apart the Congo, um, assassinate the democratically elected president and install a bloody dictator, Joseph Mobutu, in his place because he'd keep the minerals flowing in the direction they wanted. So the Congo never had a chance. It was just corruption, destruction, poverty, and then violence after violence. And so you're, that's your starting point when you get to year 2010 and the Cobalt Revolution takes off. Um, a country, a people with uh, such a history of destruction, Conrad, who was in, uh, Joseph Conrad, who was in Congo during Leopold's time, that's what inspired Heart of Darkness. And to this day, it is still the heart of darkness. This is just a new chapter. And now we have a new automobile renaissance. Remember, it was rubber for rubber tires the first time the car was invented. Now we've got electric cars, which are important for us uh, from a sustainability climate standpoint. But they need cobalt in those batteries. And guess who has all the cobalt? Once again, Congo. So the new pillage has begun. I just want to shout out uh, King Leopold's ghost. I uh, saw that, you know, Adam Hochschild uh, blurbed like the front of the book. It's on the cover. So that's a huge kind of like huge endorsement uh, for, for for your work. Um, so folks who definitely want to learn more about that 1800s to like early uh, 1900s period, definitely check that out. Uh, a question about uh, sort of post-independence, because I don't know that much about the period, was the kind of like intervention and corruption was that like tied to the cold war so was that like us versus the Soviets? like was that part of the dynamic yeah that was part of it and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned king leopold's ghost by the way uh i mean people should read that book because you can't understand congo you can't understand africa you know without understanding that period of not just the congo's history but africa's history um it's not just the slave trade but it's what was done post-slave trade during the colonial period oh but yeah, this uh, this um, Soviet dynamic was a big factor. So Lumumba, I mentioned him, he was the country's first democratically elected president, um, um, and won the election on the promise of um, keeping the country's resources for its own benefit, uh, for the benefit of its people. Uh, remember, this is a country that's coming out of centuries of foreign, foreign plunder. So it's a natural nationalist message, um, but it got the Belgians uh, uh, and their sort of neo-colonial pals really anxious. So as I said, Belgium annexed the mining provinces 11 days after independence. So the country's thrown into crisis. Uh, Lumumba reached out to the United Nations. This was 1960, 1961. He, re he reached out to the United Nations um, for help saying, look, they just chopped off part of our country and we need that to survive. Can you uh, send a force to kick the Belgians out and reunify our country? And the UN um, sent a force uh, to stabilize, but they did not kick out the Belgians. They let them stay there. Let, they let them keep the, the mining provinces. So Lumumba said, well, we can't survive as a country. What's the point of the UN if you're not going to help, you know, kick out these invaders who have chopped off part of our, our most valuable uh, part of our country? So we turned to the Soviet Union. He said, can you help? And the minute he did that, uh, he sealed his fate. The U.S., the U.N., Belgium, uh, they couldn't stomach the idea that those mineral riches that were so valuable uh, would be directed towards the Soviet Union. And they immediately started a plot to assassinate Lumumba. And within six months, he had been killed, chopped into pieces, dissolved in acid, um, bones grind down, except for one tooth that was taken by the Belgian head of police as a souvenir. Uh, and that was the lesson that was taught to anybody who was thinking of running uh, a country in post-colonial Africa uh, and not playing ball. 
And so, yeah, it was very much about Cold War. It was also very much about basically saying, okay, you can have your freedom now, but only if you ba- if you uh, continue sending resources our way. And if you don't, we'll make lessons of, you know, your supposed supposedly elected leaders to teach you what the consequences will be. Yeah. And I ask about the Cold War context because obviously, you know, this came up during your Rogan interview. Um, there's a huge global competition over um, cobalt batteries, like those styles of uh, like technology, really. So is there any, like, obviously, like, it's not as if the US and China are in like a purely like ideological struggle. It's not quite the same like metaphor, but does international competition play into the dynamic we're seeing today at all? Yeah, Ch- China, China, it, it, it's China's, uh, they're, t- they're taking their turn at pillaging the Congo right now. Um, uh, before anybody knew what was happening, they cornered the entire cobalt market in the Congo. They signed some very corrupt deals with the former president, uh, Joseph Kabila. Uh, there's been some very thorough investigating um, done by journalists that, you know, he siphoned off money, uh, took bribes and paybacks to basically carve up these huge mining concessions and sell them off to uh, China state run mining companies. And Chinese companies run 15 of the 19 major mining concessions in um, the mining provinces of the Congo. That's where all the cobalt's coming from. Um, uh, So they control the production. They supplied roughly 75 to 80% of refined cobalt to the global market. So they have the supply chain. They also have two of the biggest battery manufacturers. Uh, So from dirt to battery, they dominate the supply chain, um, vertically integrated. And so there's, uh, and the U.S. has no mining presence in the Congo at all. There was one U.S. mining company there called Freeport McMoran, uh, but they sold off um, their concession to a Chinese company, uh, and that ended the U.S. presence there. And now the U.S. and its Western allies are trying to play catch up because they realize China has a complete control of this very valuable and crucial supply chain. Um, and, but there's just not much else cobalt out there. So, uh, you know, President Biden had actually, uh, uh, his administration signed an MOU, I think a week or two ago, uh, with uh, the DRC and, and Zambia uh, to support and cultivate um, EV battery uh, supply chains what that actually means, we'll have to see. But there's definitely an effort to play catch up uh, on the part of the U.S. Uh, because they were left sort of um, um, flat footed uh, in the time that China moved in, secured territory and basically monopolized this chain. And, you know, we're kind of playing shorthand when we just refer to like the Congo. But by you referring to, to Zambia, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, like what countries are we actually talking about here? Yeah, so DRC is Democratic Republic of the Congo. That's like the entire central heart of Africa. If you look at a map, uh, it's the entire midsection of the country. Uh, It's surrounded by nine, eight or nine other African countries, um, you know, working clockwise. You've got, um, uh, there's Republic of Congo, which is a small country just to the west of the DRC. You've got the Central African Republic to the north, and you've got Rwanda, uh, Uganda, Burundi uh, to the east, moving down to uh, Zambia on the southeast and south, and then Angola to the southwest. Uh, so it's you know it's the entire central part of the continent, um, uh, surrounded um, by eight or nine other countries. The the mineral, uh, cobalt, copper, um, uh, rich soil is in an area called the Central African Copper Belt, which is this little crescent, like 400 kilometers by 100 kilometers. Um, About 90% of it or 85% of it of that crescent is in the southeastern part of the DRC. And then there's a touch of it that's in Zambia. Um, It's mostly copper in that part of the uh, Copper Belt. Uh, As you move northwest along that crescent, uh, there's more and more uh, density and grade of cobalt attached mm-hmm. to the copper. So another question that comes to mind then is, given your articulation of how extensive just Chinese ownership of the chain is, what exactly are we or anyone really supposed to do? And not just in the like, what can I as an individual do? I more just mean that 
and once again, this gets complicated because like we're talking, you know, about like the global north versus the global south. But like a lot of these frameworks and these arguments tend to be made within like a like quasi like Western human rights like framework, which is definitely one that at a minimum you could agree the Chinese don't believe in, subject themselves to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how does that kind of like play into this? Yeah, look, I don't think we have to mince our words. I mean, the, the Chinese companies operating in the Congo uh, do not incorporate um, concepts of human rights and sustainability in the way uh, that you and I uh, would if we were running those mines, okay? Um, and, they are quick, there. And, and, and quick question, when, yeah. when, you, when you say that you and I would, I'll be ungenerous to the two of us and just assume we're just rapacious capitalists in this joint venture. I'm sure there are, there are legal limits. They would right. police. So, so, so there's our more personal like morals, but there's also legal limits. I'm assuming. Yeah. You know, say, say, say you and I were running a, a mining company, you know, with headquarters in the U S we, we are subject to the foreign corrupt practices act. We are subject to uh, a certain level of uh, auditing, a certain level of public disclosure of uh, any treachery we may get involved in. We can be investigated for bribery or corruption. Um, if some journalists were to head down there and uncover that you and I are exploiting Congolese children in servile, hazardous, uh, miserable labor conditions, they'd write a story about it. Some congressman would pick it up and maybe make uh, a, a convening on it. You know, there. I'm not saying our country's perfect and our system is perfect. No, of course not, because at the top of the chain are U.S.-based companies availing of this cobalt yeah. um, without consequence. Uh, and, and so we have to recognize that. But there are mechanisms for internal correction and policing that we have uh, that certainly China does not. Uh, and so they're, they're operating there. And I'm telling you this from firsthand observation, months on the ground, repeated trips across years. Um, people and earth in, in the mining province, uh, provinces of the Congo um, are being utterly destroyed. It's it's only about the loot, it's only about the the the, the what's valuable in the dirt, uh, and and that's what's being pulled out uh, at a rapacious pace, um, without consideration for the consequences near and long term to the people and environment uh, in that part of the Congo. What happens when everything's been scavenged out of the ground? Uh, and these companies move on, leaving nothing but poverty, misery, and valueless dirt behind. What happens to the people there? Um, no one's investing in the in the communities there. Uh, no one's trying to develop, support, or uh, uh, empower communities there. When I say no one, I mean these companies. They say they are. They say they do. But you get there, and there's there's nothing happening. So, um, yes, um, you and I. We can't fix this problem as individuals. We can raise awareness and we must and should. And that's what you're doing now with this conversation, which is so valuable and so important. Uh, but ultimately, it is up to the stakeholders at the top of the chain uh, to start fixing this problem because demand started with them. No one put a gun to the, to the heads of these companies and said, you must use COBOL or else. You know, they started a chain of events by putting cobalt in batteries and selling us these things. And they have to own and take accountability for the consequences of that chain of events all the way down to the child caked in toxic dirt, grime and filth in the Congo. Uh, and their refusal to do so is a, a problem uh, that this country needs to remedy because many of these companies, not all of them are headquartered here. There are others of course, uh, headquartered in other countries, but the big titans of industry, okay, they're here. Uh, and and the problems start with them and need the solutions need to begin with them. So two questions follow from that then. So one, could you, and I know you're comfortable doing this, like name some names, but then two, what do they say in regards to this, right? Because there's a counter. I'm not saying it's a morally okay counter, but there's obviously because once again, given the legal dynamics, frankly, the P like the, the 1990s sweatshop stuff was a disaster for companies like Nike. There's a reason why Phil Knight has a whole like two or three chapters on it in his you know big autobiography. So what do they say in response to the dynamics that you're describing? Because you're not you're not once again like this is extensive, but you are not the first person to bring this up um, no, in these contexts. No, of 
No, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, there have been some NGOs on the ground trying to uh, expose this truth. Uh, there are some journalists who have been into the Congo trying to expose this truth. Uh, uh, there are people who have come before me and many people who come after me. Now, my book is the first book on this subject. Uh, and I think I've been to places and, and gone deeper uh, than just about any other outsider has to uncover the truth. Uh, not the first layer, not even the second layer, but all the way down to the inner uh, uh, deep truth of what's happening in the Congo. And I think that's what my book reveals through the voices of the Congolese people. Um, but what do the companies say? They say that there's no problem, or if there is a problem, it's not in their supply chain. And they say that they uphold human rights standards all the way down to the mining level. And they have zero tolerance policies on child labor. And they've given money to so and such foundation and so and such NGO. Uh, and all of our chain is uh, uh, adheres to standards of international human rights and sustainable practices. And they'll all say it down to the mining level. And then you get down to the mining level and you see that that's all a fiction. It's all a fiction. None of what they say they're doing is actually being done on the ground. And I can only assume it's because they think, well, who's actually going to go down to the Congo uh, and demonstrate otherwise? And until that day, we can just carry on with business as usual. And even when that day comes, we'll probably find some way to spin it and make it go away because... I put myself in their shoes. These are trillion dollar, super powerful companies with all the lobbying influence and marketing influence in the world. You know, the problems of the people in the Congo are a, a minor annoyance, even if even if revealed. OK, that's so uh, what we have to do is uh, continue bringing ground truth up to the world, uh, world's attention uh, until they can't ignore it anymore and have to take reasonable uh, and sustained efforts to address all of the offense, all of the indignity, all of the exploitation, all of the pillage and plunder that's taking place as a consequence of a sequence that began with their demand for COBOL. You know, something I'm wondering, because once again, we're doing the comparison to the 1990s sweatshops and Nike. I'm wondering if at a almost like consumer level, there's a difference between like hardware and just like consumer goods. So it's like one thing to put on a pair of, you know, Air Jordans when there's this broad campaign about how sweatshop labor and all those bad things, there's actually the ability to put pressure on like Michael Jordan himself. But with like my iPhone or something, I don't think people have like the same attachment um, to hardware goods versus just like generic consumer ones. Like, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, the irony is you could you could survive and and uh, function perfectly fine on a day to day basis without those sneakers or the shirt uh, that's being made in, in those conditions of child labor and sweatshops, but you can't function at all from sunrise to sunset without that smartphone you just picked up uh, or any of the any of the other gadgets that we use, um, and so in point of fact we should feel a very deep attachment to what's happening in the Congo. Uh, and I think that's the connective tissue that will be formed as this story continues uh, to be exposed. Uh, that, wait a minute, every time I plug in my phone and I send out a, a tweet or I check my Instagram or, or whatever you do on social media or send an email um, or take a photo, uh, I'm doing that by virtue of the exploitation, uh, injury, contamination and death of people in the Congo. Like we have to feel that viscerally uh, because we're so intimately connected to it. No matter that there are thousands of miles away and layers in the supply chain separate us, ultimately there's a, there is a, an unrelenting line of connection between us and children in the Congo by virtue of the batteries and all the stuff we use every day. So let's uh, make the chain literal here because we've talked about, I think, both ends. We've talked about, um, you know, young children literally just digging up amongst uh, toxic sludge. And we've talked about, you know, Apple, like a big company. Like what, what's actually in between? So A, like what's in between and who owns what? So is are the are the children like employed, quote unquote, by like a Chinese mining concession, like what, what, what's in between those two places? 
Yeah, so I, I go through this in detail in my book because I spend a lot of time tracing the supply chain, right? Because the you asked about, you know, what would companies say? Well, one of the things they say is, well, it's it's someone else's responsibility downstream, you know, and they keep pointing their finger downstream um, until the last finger is pointed at the kid in the condo. And, and then no one's accepted responsibility for him or her. Um, so what does the chain look like? So if you start at the bottom and you've got a child or, uh, you know, and their mother or father and sister uh, scrounging through toxic uh, conditions to, to gather cobalt and they gather it up and they put it in a sack, right? That's, that's the very bottom of the bottom of the chain. Um, that sack of cobalt that they'll sell for a couple of dollars and then that's their income for the day, okay, um, will be sold to traders. They're called negotiants. Um, and those traders uh, will sell the cobalt um, either to another layer in the supply chain called buying houses, um, or they'll sell it directly to mining companies. Um, if they sell it to buying houses, the buying houses sell it to mining companies. So no matter mm -hmm. what, it gets sold to mining companies. Um, and from that point forward, we're in the formal supply chain. So mining company then um, processes the ore. You know, the stone has various things in it. Cobalt's never by itself in nature. It's always attached to copper and nickel and, uh, and sometimes radioactive uranium. So that's another kind of exposure these children and, and mm -hmm. their parents are uh, suffering. So they process that ore to separate the cobalt from the copper, from the nickel, and so on into sort of a crude but separated metal form. Uh, that then gets exported by truck and then sea, uh, most, mostly to China, where it's then refined to commercial grade form. And I think last year, China supplied the world with about 70 25 or 80 percent of uh, uh, refined cobalt uh, to the world supply. So almost all of it. Um, that refined cobalt gets sold to battery manufacturers who then make the battery that goes in the phone or the laptop or the e-scooter or the e-bike or the whatever. And then, of course, the electric car. Uh, so then the battery gets sold to the manufacturer of the phone in the car. And then that gets sold to us. So that's the sequence of events. So here's the important thing. Formal supply chain is from the mining company up. Informal supply chain is mining company down. And there are these layers of intermediaries, traders and buying houses that basically serve as a laundering mechanism to get child mine cobalt into the formal supply chain. Because the mining company doesn't want to go and just buy it from the kid. The optics wouldn't work. Because they have to say, no child labor in our supply. So it gets laundered through these little traders and depots and buying houses and then put into the formal supply chain. Now, crucially, crucially, the other way in which artisanal cobalt ends up in the formal supply chain is that despite claims to the contrary, almost every single industrial mine, the formal supply, part of the supply chain, has artisanal miners working inside. Mm -hmm. They'll say they're not there because who's going to show otherwise? But they're all there digging cobalt, boosting production for penny wages. So that part of it doesn't even have to go through intermediaries. They just dig on the mining concession and it's sold right into the formal supply chain directly. Then, of course, there's dirt, valuable dirt all over the place near villages and in forests and so on. And that's where other people dig. And that part gets funneled through these intermediaries right into the formal supply chain. So for this last section, I want to hit a couple news you can use things for folks. So let's talk about different actors. Like what in your ideal world would the US federal government, regulatory agencies, State Department, et cetera, do about this? Ideal world? I'll tell you exactly what I would like to see. We have something called the Trade Facilitation Act uh, that prohibits the import of goods made through child labor or forced labor. You can't get it out of the uh, port on arrival. If it can be demonstrated that some part of it in peace or whole was made through child labor, forced labor. Well, I'd like to see that applied to every smartphone, every tablet, every laptop, and every electric vehicle that's arriving on our shores because I can guarantee you they all have child labor, forced labor, and worse, inside of them. 
And that would change the conversation very quickly because then the onus would be on the companies selling those devices and cars to ensure that there's no child labor and forced labor in their supply chains. See, right now the causality is it's, it's, it's backwards. Um, companies can sit back and keep doing business and making money and availing of child labor and forced labor because there's no consequence. But if you flip it around and actually enforce laws that we have on the books, and that gets back to our point about there are things that our country has, there are mechanisms that we can use that other countries don't have. We have a very powerful tool, and it, it was signed under uh, under President Obama. So this is, you know, it's a relatively recent um, uh, piece of legislation. You apply that, and then suddenly every phone, tablet, laptop, e whatever, and car that's manufactured abroad that has cobalt in the battery can't leave the port unless companies clean up their supply chains. I guarantee you it happens in a much quicker and more reliable and robust time frame than it would otherwise. And by the way, on that point, it's not like this is a hard problem to solve. All these companies already claim they're doing all these things and there's no child labor and forced labor and sustainable practices and so on. All they have to do is accomplish the things they say they're doing. And so the key thing is, because I liked your formal versus informal chain, within yeah. the formal chain, quote unquote, these practices are being um, pursued. The issue is that that does not extend to the informal it's, chain. It's the informal chain. And in fact, circling back to uh, the start of our conversation, that reality exists across the underbelly of the global economy. It's the informal substrate of supply chains, where you find child labor, forced labor, uh, labor abuse, um, uh, and unsustainable practices, uh, uh, be it garment production, uh, cocoa harvesting, palm oil. Um, uh, you can go on and on, agricultural products, tea, coffee. You can go on and on across the global economy. It's that informal underbelly. Everybody knows it's there. Everybody looks the other way. and. In the case of cobalt, um, the informal part of the supply chain is supplying, I think, at least 30% of the cobalt that's ultimately exported from the Congo and 30% of 75% means, what, half the world supply? Okay. Um, or maybe a third or a fourth, whatever. Someone can do the math uh, on their smartphone as they're listening. Um, uh, so... That has to be addressed, and it means you just get down into the ground. How many of the CEOs of these companies that sell phones and cars and so on have actually gone to the Congo to see where, where their cobalt is coming from? Any of them? I mean, have any of them ever even stepped foot to see the bottom of their supply chain that they rely on? And they're happy to be billionaires, as a consequence of this cobalt. So surely that merits them taking one week of their life to go down to the Congo and see with their own eyes, wait a minute, I do see kids. I see people in the artisanal mine. I see toxic exposure. They do not have hand gloves. They do not have goggles. Um, there's a baby on her back, her back, her back. That baby's being exposed. This is a problem. They don't have schools. They don't have public health clinics. We're, we're, we have a lot of money. We rely on them, their labor, their resources. Let's sort this out. None of them are even willing to go there. I'll take them. I'm offering any one of them right here, right now, if they're listening, um, I will take you. We'll go and I'll show you around. Let, let's go see the bottom of your supply chain together. It's worth your time. You owe it to the people of the Congo to go and see the bottom of your supply chain. And I think at that point, it will be hard for them to not address this problem. So they can either do it because they have a sense of moral obligation and duty to their Congolese employees, or we can use legislation like the Trade Facilitation Act I mentioned to ban the import. Either way, pincer movement, let's just bring the pressure and solve this horror. I think uh, last two questions. So number one would be, what is the like we said, we, we really started by talking about how given the 70% of global capacity that's in the Congo, given just like the clear electronics needs, just everyday life, but also down to climate change, we're 
going to need resources from the Congo. What does your ideal scenario look like? Um, cause I, for example, you were on the Rogan episode, you said like $10 uh, a day, I believe. Um, so that's not even like an American minimum wage, just like articulate for us, like what that reasonable accommodation looks like. Yeah. Look, th- there's, there's some little things that could be done tomorrow that would eliminate the majority of the harm, uh, and misery being suffered by the people of the Congo who dig out our cobalt, uh, give them a fixed, decent, livable wage. Uh, and I say, yeah, ten dollars a day. That's the difference between child labor and no child labor. Right now, if you earn a dollar or two or three, uh, you have to bring your child to work to earn another dollar or two to survive, to eat, to have clothes, um, and, and, and just base survival. Now, imagine something as simple as ten dollars, like an hour, a dollar an hour. Uh, then children could stay in school. Adults would have a decent wage. Um, uh, and that would solve or help solve a lot of the child labor problems because it's out of poverty desperation that families bring children to work to boost their basic survival income. So how about a decent wage? How about some PPE? Gloves, boots, uniforms, masks, goggles to protect all the people there from the toxic contamination associated with digging for cobalt. Cobalt is highly toxic and they touch it and breathe it, uh, and it all adds up. And there are massive public health consequences. You you spend time on the ground, people are suffering through cancers, respiratory ailments, uh, skin disease, eye disease, neurological problems, because of simple exposure. Uh, uh, I mean, it's not simple, but because simply they're exposed to the toxic uh, nature of cobalt. So some basic PPE would help. if we avail of the labor and resources of this part of the Congo, aren't we obliged to do something to support those communities? Uh, shouldn't we build some schools and some public health clinics and maybe help expand electrification and sanitation so that pe- people can live there with some basic human dignity rather than just ransack the place and run off like a virus, um, just feeding, devouring, uh, and leaving a carcass behind? That's where we're headed right now. Uh, And that's what we have to stop. So there's little things that can be done uh, that will radically improve conditions. And finally, the mining companies that are operating there, they've clear cut millions of trees. I never met anyone who heard of anyone planting one to replace them. They dump toxic uh, effluents into the water, into the air, into the dirt. They treat the place like a toilet. They behave in ways they wouldn't behave in their home countries. But it's okay to treat the people of the Congo that way, to treat the environment in the heart of Africa like like a toilet. Um, So that needs to stop because that has broader public health um, consequences, that level of contamination. So all these things that could be done in a snap if there were the will to treat the people in the Congo the people in the heart of Africa with the same dignity and respect that we would want to be treated here ourselves. You know, and the last big question, this is something I'm I'm really fascinated by. Um, So once again, like your first podcast appearance last month is with Joe Rogan. Obviously you're on a publicity tour, but not just a publicity tour for your book, but for this movement and this issue. If you look back at the 1990s front shop issue, a fun fact, um, despite like the stakes is Jonah Peretti, he, you know, Jonah Peretti founds Buzzfeed, like famously, he first started getting interested in virality because he, um, used Nike ID to say like, basically, thank you for the sweatshop labor. It's when you could customize your shoes, you could still do this. They said, no, it kind of like went viral. People forwarded the email chain. Then he went on the today show. And back then if you go on the today show in the, you know, early two thousands, like that's huge. Rogan is huge, but Rogan is huge in the sense that like modern media is huge as in he's very siloed. So can you just sort of talk about how you think about publicity and publicizing a campaign when you just gotten the biggest podcast in the world, but like your reach across society is almost certainly smaller. So for example, policymakers are probably not listening to that Rogan episode. Um, I probably are going to have more Hill staffers listen to this episode than the Rogan episode. 
that's just kind of fascinating to me. And that's why I know like how I could, as an author, reporter, activist, you think about this dynamic. Yeah, it's it's certainly a very fragmented media landscape, right? Uh, it, it, more fragmented uh, than in years past, for sure. Um, uh, but here's the thing: I'm I'm on an awareness mission. Um, you know, you and I having this conversation. You're very gracious to invite me on to talk about this issue. My sole purpose here is for people to learn about the tragedy uh, and this new chapter of horror taking place in the Congo. Uh, and I and I say that because. I believe the following. When people learn of an injustice, a great injustice, there will always be a meaningful segment of the population whose conscience and compassion uh, demands that they do something. I don't have all the answers to fix this problem. I know some things that would certainly help very quickly to fix a lot of the problems, but I'm not smart enough, influential enough, uh, powerful enough to to have all the answers. But there are people out there who do and who will. And there is a movement that I know is awaking from slumber uh, that will take this on until the work is done. And so I want to just do my part and you and I together are today doing our part to expand and amplify the voices of the Congolese people to a world that cannot survive and function without their suffering. And, and that formula is repugnant. Uh, we need to function and survive by the grace and good uh, dignity of the Congolese people, not their misery. Uh, and so it's up to us to invert that reality. Uh, and so whether it's my book, my book is written as hopefully a pass-through of Congolese voices to reader through me. Uh, you know, it's not about me at all. Um, uh, and these podcasts, uh, any interviews that I do, um, the the purpose solely is to amplify their voices, their truth um, uh, to an audience that I know exists and a population of people who I know will be driven by conscience uh, and compassion uh, to address this horror. But you're right, you know, it's a fragmented media marketplace. Um, you know, you've got to hit one silo and then another silo and another <laughs> silo, uh, it, you know. It's not the days where everyone tuned in to Johnny Carson at the same time and, you know, half the country watched his thing. Um, uh, so the more invitations I get, I will take them small, big, medium, um, because eventually, as I said, we'll get to that critical mass um, uh, where the where enough people in the world say, no, no, no more of this horror on my watch. And, and that's how the first Congo horror was uh, dealt with. People went and got the truth and brought it to the world. Uh, and there were there were forces uh, that wanted to keep things the way they were, and they used every trick in the book and every lever of power and influence they had to suppress the truth. But ultimately, decency and conscience and goodness won. Um, that didn't solve the problems of all the problems of the Congo, uh, but it solved the colonial uh, uh, pillage that was taking place under Leopold. Um, uh, and so now we have to just do it again and we have to just keep doing it as long as it takes. Uh, but that's, that's the calling um, that, that, that people I hope will hear the voices from the Congo reaching out to them to say, please, um, we are dying here. So you can plug in your things. We'll keep digging this stuff out, but you need to help. Yeah. And so let's just close with where folks should go next. So obviously we shouted out, um, King Leopold's Ghost. That's a great place to go after folks check out your book. I'd also suggest Dancing in the Glory of Monsters, which is about um, the post uh, 1990s wars, wars in the Congo. But I also would like you to shout out the audiobook version um, of Cobalt Red. I've heard you like recorded like a special like opening for it. So let's just close with that. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah. There's an audio version, and they asked me to record like a little opening, you know, message. So. Um, I, I did that. There's uh, just an opening message of what I hope people will learn and hear um, uh, as they listen to the audiobook. So, uh, and there's a terrific uh, voice uh, author, actor, or whatever they're called, who recorded the book. Uh, I heard it. Um, does a great job. Um, so, whether they listen to it, you know, or or read it, um, uh, the point is. Uh, let's keep spreading the awareness of what's happening in the Congo. It's been hidden from us for far too long. 
by powerful stakeholders that want to keep the status quo and it's up to us to demand um, that people with whom we are so intimately connected and are suffering immensely for our daily lives, um, we have to reach out to them uh, and demand that these, these injustices um, uh, be dealt with, not through facile marketing statements and proclamations of uh, adherence to human rights standards, but get down there on the ground with your team, keep them there, and ensure that day in and day out, the people of the Congo are afforded the same dignity uh, of existence uh, that we would expect for our people here in our country. Really well said. Siddharth, thank you for joining me on The Realignment. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate your invitation uh, to talk about this uh, topic. Thank you. 